Okay. Let me start off with what um, one of the things that uh, the Fed chair said. He said there's been substantial further progress on inflation, but just clear progress when it comes to employment. Do you agree with that? And what is the distinction between the two? Well, I do agree with that, uh, Steve. You know, we did set out a test for slowing the pace of our purchases in December. We wanted to see that substantial progress, further progress towards our mandate. And I do agree with the chair. Uh, I think we've certainly met that standard with regards to inflation. You know, we say we'd like inflation to average 2% over time, and certainly this year it will do that. I think we've made progress on the labor market. In July, we decided it wasn't substantial, but, you know, we've had 800,000 jobs per month for the last uh, three months. And so I expect uh, that those gains will continue in the fall. And if that happens, I would also support commencing a reduction in the pace of our purchases later uh, this year. Yeah, this is sort of like an English monetary policy class for you, the former professor. I was, I was going to say, you kind of gave me an answer there, but I, want, I do want to ask this specifically. What does it take yeah. in your mind to turn clear progress into substantial further progress? Well, I think we're on a pace to do that. You know, we've had the 800,000 jobs per month the last uh, three months. Uh, I think under my baseline outlook, we're going to have robust job gains uh, in the fall. I don't think it takes 800,000 per month, but robust gains. Um, and I think that if, if that materializes, then I think I would, I, I would support commencing a reduction in the pace of our purchases later uh, this year. Richard, you had said in a previous speech uh, not too long ago that 3% core PCE, that of course is the Fed's preferred inflation me measure, yeah. was more than moderate. It printed this morning, I'm sure you know, at 3.6%. I guess the question is, do you intend to do anything about that? Does that change your policy when inflation is running above what appears to be your comfort zone? Steve, the answer right now is no. And the reason is, I know you've heard this before from me and my colleagues, but we do believe and we share this view with most private forecasters that what we're seeing in inflation this year, while unwelcome, is very likely to be largely uh, transitory. You know, it's taking some time and there are some bottlenecks in reopening the economy and they're frankly larger than, than I expected. But that being said, I think there's good reason to believe that as we go into 2022 and 2023, inflation is gonna move back much closer to our 2% longer run uh, goal. Uh, I should also say, let me be clear, uh, that if we saw clear evidence uh, that this was not the case and that this increase in inflation was going to be persistent and move up inflation expectations. And as the chair indicated in his remarks today, uh, we would use our tools as a committee to guide inflation back to goal. So that's not our baseline case. We think it's largely transitory, but, but we're looking at the data closely. Richard, I'll affirm your comment that I have heard this idea of transitory inflation from your <laughs> colleagues previously. But 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 I also want to say that I've heard from others of your colleagues also, many of them today and yesterday, that they yeah. have this rising concern that inflation uh, is going to be around longer than what they thought was a three month thing or a six month thing. Now they're hearing from their business contacts that it's something that they uh, yeah. uh, might, might linger longer and, and be more persistent and they want to move fast. Are you in that area of concern when it comes to the idea that no. transitory inflation could be around longer and there's a risk around that? So, so what I would say, Steve, is my baseline view is that it is largely transitory. But I've also said, and I'll repeat it on air today, I do think that the risks to, to inflation are to the, to the upside. Um, and that's why I think I my colleagues are going to be looking at the data closely. You know, Steve, I think we're going to get a better read on the labor market in particular uh, this fall. You know, we had an unprecedented shutdown of the economy. The, the reopening is complex. And I think we'll have a better sense of where the labor market uh, is uh, in the fall in terms of matching supply uh, and uh, demand. So I think it is a risk case. You know, central banks get paid to be in the risk management business, and I'm very uh, certainly attuned and attentive to those risks. But my baseline view, again, is that it will be largely uh, transitory. Rich, you know, we can have a discussion from the other side of this uh, of, on the economy, which is from the downside risk part. And I'd like to give you an opportunity to address those. Um, there's the Delta variant. And, and as you just said, unemployment uh, benefits will be rolling off for a lot of uh, uh, Americans come September. How much concern does that give you for downside risk to the economy? 
Yeah, let's, those are both uh, both something on my radar screen. Not surprisingly, let's go through them uh, in turn. Obviously, the sharp rise in COVID infections uh, is is a cause for concern. Certainly, as a matter of public uh, health. You know, that said, I'm looking at the high frequency data, as I'm sure are you and many of your viewers. And right now, uh, it's not causing me to mark down my outlook for economic activity uh, in a material way. But clearly, Delta does pose a downside risk to the outlook. Um, and I do think we need to be attuned and attentive to the data to look for signs uh, that economic growth uh, may be slowing uh, faster than we expect. You know, in terms of benefits, uh, you are correct that a number of the extended unemployment benefits will be expiring uh, in uh, the fall. I think we and others have factored that into uh, our outlook. Clearly, that support was welcome and needed during the, the, the toughest days of the uh, pandemic. But the household sector, Steve, as you know, in the aggregate has more than $2 trillion in accumulated mm -hmm. excess saving because a lot of those transfers to households from fiscal support were not spent. And I think that provides a very important uh, and solid buffer uh, to the uh, economy. And also, I think that there probably will be some positive effects on labor supply, both from the expiration of the benefits as well as a return to schooling that we expect in many parts of the uh, country. So I think that's the way it looks uh, right now.